My name is Thomas Heckner. Uh, I did, did uh, bachelor and master studies in the, at the University of Applied Sciences in Hamburg. I did computer media security and bachelor studies and uh, secure information systems in master studies. I also went to, to the university, uh, the Edith Cohen University in Australia for about half a year. I did uh, terrorism and inf introduction to information warfare and also advances in security technology there. It was my physical security bit. And well, I started with uh, IT security, I think, about 10 years ago, just trying around a little bit, using all these, these kind of old school hacker tools. And uh, well, with my education, I progressed in this as well. And uh, I started basically with um, system administration, network administration, and did then more into IT security, worked at the, um, the CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team at Siemens. Then I, I went to Secure Integration, it's a SAP security company, I worked there for about four months, and ended up in Vienna in a penetration testing company. That's basically the field where I've worked in the latest. With lock picking and physical security, I started about, I think, three to four years ago. I remember when I bought my first lock. It was, I just walked over to the next store, bought the lock for about, I don't know, eight years or something, with padlock. And I also bought some tools and just tried to open it somehow. I actually had no one who showed me how to open it, so I just fooled around a bit and tried it out. And I think after one hour just trying to get it open, suddenly it opened. And I can really tell you if, you, if you're sitting there and just trying to open something, you don't know how, and after one hour it gets open, you're getting really excited. And uh, I think that was also this first part where I really went into physical security. And then the whole story started. Like, well. About two years ago, um, a former police officer, a security chief officer or something in, in Upper Austria, uh, approached me and he said, come on, let's do something like physical security at the University of Applied Sciences in Hamburg. We didn't have that before, so we started our course. Now we're three people. It's uh, the police officer. It's Evelyn Shallow. He's sitting here. Uh, she's doing studies abroad here at the university. And, um, yeah, and me, of course. I have to also put a picture up here that reminds me, I have to tell you, I also have some hobbies besides all that. And one of these hobbies is parkour. I don't know if you already know parkour. Probably some, some don't. So I'll just explain it shortly. It's basically a sport and it's also an art form. So uh, it's basically about getting from one point to another in the least amount of time and the most efficient way. So no matter if there are walls or fences in between, you just jump over them, try to get over them or circumvent them somehow, just uh, for, for the best way to get through. And I basically put all these together in just one thing, and that was when I founded my own company in September. So it's pretty new, it's pretty fresh. And uh, I basically do security assessments of all kinds. So I try to get into companies physically, try to hack them probably from the inside, get the information, get out again, write the report, and tell them how to fix all these vulnerabilities. And uh, probably I can tell you some of my experiences so far and what I've watched in the last couple of years or last couple of months, and I will tell you about this in this presentation then. So at the beginning of this presentation, uh, I want to tell you a sh short story. Um, there was a, a company in the finance sector, and there were three people approaching this company, and they were just uh, had casual wear or something, and they went into this uh, in the front entrance, and there was this reception, and they wanted to get by this reception to pass this reception, and this receptionist said, "Hey, come on, who are you? You want to get in?" And actually they answered, yeah, we are from the IT department. There were some failures with the, with the computers upstairs in the floor three, and we want to get in. And the receptionist said, okay, that's all right, so get upstairs. And to get into this company, they didn't go to, to the floor three. They actually had a, another goal where they get, did go to, and this was the CFO's office, the chief financial officer. And uh, they went into this office, closed the door behind them, 
just looked for some useful information for some important documents, and uh, they really found some. We really found a lot, actually. And they also accessed the computer. The computer had no password, so it was easy to, to start it, to, to log in, and to get all the information on that on a USB stick. So they've got all the, these documents, and then they needed a way to get out with all these documents. What they did was uh, they asked the janitor to get a garbage pail. He gave them one, and so they put all these documents into this garbage pail and went out at the front entrance. This was uh, actually the day where this company would have lost a couple of hundred thousand dollars if these people wouldn't have been uh, penetration testers hired by the company to look for vulnerabilities. And why did it tell you this story? Basically, there are three important points uh, there. First of all is IT security. There should have probably been a password on this computer. The computer should have been probably also um, encrypted with encrypted hard drives. There could have been a bias password. So there are a couple of steps that probably would have prevented that attack on the computer. There is also a social engineering attack. So the people went through uh, past the, the receptionist. The receptionist should have challenged them more. They sh shouldn't get through at this point. And there could have been other people challenged them as well. And the third point, and this comes to our presentation now, is physical security. There are a couple of different controls and measures that could have been implemented that could have prevented this attack. There are, for example, badges for visitors, badges for employees. Um, there could have been better locks at the doors. The CFO could have locked his office if he wasn't here. So there are a couple of different issues we're going to talk about today. First of all, I will introduce you to uh, physical protection system design. Very roughly, very basic, but you should get an overview of physical security design. Uh, I got this from Marilyn Gazier. She's working in Sun's Laboratories, I think. Uh, I don't know if she went, invented that system, but she actually wrote a couple of books about it. So. Uh, it's a good place to start. Basically, there are three different functions in there. You need in every, every physical protection system. That, that's detection, delay, and response. Why do you need that one? First of all, if you don't have detection, I, an attacker could approach the company, could, in, could get in, take the information, and get out again. Nobody would ever notice. So I don't want that. So I have to detect the, detect the attacker approaching the company. But that's not enough, of course. I mean, if I see the, comp uh, I see the attacker getting in and I do nothing, then he steals my information anyway. So I have to respond to, to my detection mechanisms. Response could be either, for example, you have a police force that comes over, or you can also have your own security guards. Of course, the second one is a little bit more expensive, but uh, if you've got the money and uh, if you've got also the risk you have to face, so probably that is a solution for you. And the third one is delay. You need delay, for example, uh, or just because your response force needs some time to, re to respond. You've got the detection, then re the response force can be there just in one or two seconds. So it probably needs one to five minutes. And during this time, you have to delay the attacker so you can really catch him or confront him. This uh, is all summed up in, in, this, in this graphic. So you've got the begin action where the attacker begins his attack, and we've got the task complete where he's finished. Um, well, and at some point, probably later than the begin the attack, the first alarm would be raised. And then you need some time to, to assess the alarm to see if it was really a true alarm, to see if you have to get in action. And then you need some time to respond to it, probably to drive to this point where the alarm is raised, it was raised. Um, yeah, well, and that's basically the time of the PPS system. And this time always has to be lower, smaller than the amount of time you need for, for, the, for the adversary to approach his task, to complete his task. We, when you approach a company, when you want to secure a company, you have to look at this company of kind of different layers. So you probably will work from the outer parameter to the most inner point of this company. First of all, it's the outer parameter. 
the outer perimeter is basically your most outer protection system, your most outer line of your company. For example, when you've got a building and a bunker backyard behind it and there's a fence or wall, then this one would be your outer perimeter. You can secure it in a different couple of ways. Um, probably you will, you will install an, a motion detectors. Uh, motion detectors. Uh, you can also install, for example, in fences, there are these fiber optic cables you can put into the fence so when the fence moves the light distraction is a little different and you would raise an alarm. There are also um, kind of yeah, sound cables that would raise an alarm when it's moved. You, just, uh, you, you can put them onto the fence or the wall but you can also put them on the ground so if you step on it it will also, also raise an alarm. Um, at this point I probably want to say that uh, all these outer perimeter detection systems, they have a pretty high false alarm rate because of all the uh, animals or birds and stuff going by, or flying by, and that was raise an alarm too. So this kind of thing is more for high security companies most of the time, or companies that do have their own response force where they can check if there is an alarm or not and if that alarm is true. The inner perimeter is basically your your wall of your building. You have also a couple of different uh, ways to manage the security of this. Um, you also have motion detectors. You can have these uh, kind of, I don't know, infrared detectors. You have also radio frequency detectors you could use for opening. It means when you open a door and you want to detect that, you can use magnetic sensors that would raise an alarm when open. You could also detect passage. Passage means, uh, I don't know if that's the correct word, the word I used. <laughs> uh, if, when you just uh, make a little hole, hole, for example, in the window, and you just want to grab into it to get something out of it, then uh, you can detect that one as well. There are a couple of different ways. Um, there are different, uh, it's kind of glass detectors, glass break detectors that could detect that, but you could also use uh, light beams, for example, or your laser beams to detect such attacks. The next one you will focus on probably more risky areas in your company. For example, you want to secure a server room more than all the other parts in your company. Uh, you have a room where you've placed your safe or fault in it, so you would secure that room more than the other ones. And uh, we've got also asset protection when you specifically just want to protect one thing, like for example a painting in a uh, Museum. It moves on to, to the actual presentation now from the IT security aspect. So we want to look at this from a couple of different ways and a couple of different steps. We first will talk about the requirements. So I've looked at some standards and looked for where is physical security really required to have in an information security environment. Then we will look at standard, uh, specifically ISO 27002, and which controls it implements and how it helps you to implement these controls in your company. The last parts are practice and, and recommendation. It means we will we'll look at one report that specifically uh, looked at some companies outside, what their status of security was, and uh, we will end with some short recommendations for you. Okay, let's start with the requirements. So I basically looked at two most important standards, or two important standards, let's say like this. Two important standards is ISA 27001, the Information Security Management Standard, and this special publication 830. They both, both basically do um, this uh, information security management and also include risk management. What you see on the right side, probably I know all of you noticed, this uh, is the PDCA circle, Plan to Check Act. So when you implement an information security management system, it's not just uh, planning it, implementing it, and that's it, but you have to do it in a circle. You have to really uh, maintain your whole system to improve it all the time. It's really an ongoing process. And when we do physical security, you have to include physical security in every step of this process. So you have to plan your physical security system, you have to look for some controls where you mitigate the risks you have identified in the first step. 
then you have to check whether these risks, uh, sorry, whether these controls uh, are really meeting your expectations or not, and you improve them afterwards. And you do this in an ongoing process. When I was looking for a definition where physical security is integrated in this IT security aspect, I flew over the NIST special publication, 830, and there it says, basically says information system security is a system characteristic. And here's set of mechanisms, not just one, but a couple of different things you have to do that span the system both logically and physically. So it's pretty clear that we have to use also physical security to cover security expectations. There are a couple of different controls in the standard. There's also management controls. Um, there are also, I think, uh, technical controls. And there are operational security controls. Two of them also include physical security. So we've got uh, the media access and disposal thing. So we, we'll cover that later on as well, so I won't go into m too much detail at the moment. And uh, the second one is also pretty clear. We have to provide physical security. And I've talked about some of these uh, already just before in the first, first slide, a couple of slides before. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to ISO 27001. Basically, it's a more general approach to IT security management. And we won't have something like the word physical security or physical mentioned in this standard just when you really started before, because it uh, basically says you have to conduct a risk management, you have to be, be aware of your own risks, that are, uh, yeah, <laughs> of your own risks, actually. And, uh, well, if you've got some information or important documents and you want to secure them, then you have to look at all different risks that you have to face. And one of these is also, of course, someone getting in, getting the information, getting out again. And so this is, physical security is an integral part of ISO 27001. However, we've got uh, the NXA, and the NXA covers a couple of different, uh, different controls that you could implement uh, to cover this physical security aspect. At this point, I have to say, we are already stepping from ISO 27001 to the ISO 27002 standard, because these controls in the NXA are covered in more detail in the second standard. So we we'll look at all, the, all of these two, two areas and cover them more in detail now. The first point uh, in uh, secure areas is physical, physical security parameter. We've already talked about it. So one important thing is to to protect your outer parameter and also your inner parameter somehow. You can, uh, for example, install motion detectors that we covered before, but you could also um, just build walls to, to increase your delay time for, for the attacker. You don't need to um, build man-made things like walls or fences, but you could also use natural barriers, for example. I found um, this situation uh, in Upper Austria, it's actually the campus from the university. University is on the lower side of this picture. And the other one is the student dormitory. And uh, you probably see the, the most basic thing here is the security gate in, in black. And uh, there are a couple of different ways to circumvent this security gate at this point. So one of the easiest ways is indicated by the red line. There are a couple of, uh, couple of parking slots just besides the security gate. And the, if there are two slots just uh, adjacent that are free, you could just drive through. So you could just drive by the security gate. That's also possible because the receptionist can't see to the security gate. He's located inside the building, so he won't notice it anyway. And uh, probably some of you might think, okay, it's not really a security issue, probably I've just come park my, my car inside. But uh, we've got also, we've had uh, some, some problems with people stealing uh, equipment from, from the university, I think twice. And they got a couple of computers out from the university and get away from it. With it. And actually, I think it would have been harder 
to steal all this equipment if you would have to get the equipment and walk, I don't know, 15 times the whole street up with all the computers to get it into the car than just to park the car inside and to get it in there. So it is a security issue. <coughs> the next one is Schatten Linz. It's not far away from the university. I don't know which, uh, which build, uh, to which company this building belongs to, but um, the most basic thing here is, you can't see very good, but it's the wall on this side. <coughs> I've got here a wall, I don't know, about three to four meters high probably. And I don't know why, why they build it like this, but you've got these stairs just besides the wall, going up all the wall. And you could, as an attacker, just use these stairs to get over the wall and get into the building. I mean, of course, it's, it's not really easy, but I don't know if you've noticed, but the door is open as well, so you don't even need to open it. It's just like a free entrance then. The next uh, would be physical, security, uh, physical entry controls. What the standard means is uh, you have to put some kind of authentication system in your company. It means you've got visible badges, you've got probably also electronic devices, you have these swipe cards. You've used it at your university as well, I think. Um, <clears throat> yeah, to these uh, swipe cards, or probably to more these electronic systems in general, there's one thing I, I want you to remember, I want you to look at probably the next time. Um, most of these electronic systems just protect the door latch. So probably you know this is the door, and you've got the latch, it's the spring-loaded device that you operate with your handle, and the lower, the, the lower thing is the deadbolt that really locks the door. So if you haven't locked the door, there's just a spring-loaded latch that protects the door from opening. And uh, you probably could, you could retract this, this, uh, this latch to get into it. To make it more clear what I'm meaning, I've got a little video here. hope you can see that. Okay, is that better? Okay, what, what you see on the left side is this uh, card reader where we used to use the cards to get in to authenticate. And it's actually not clearly seeable here, but you use one of uh, just a card, like a credit card, or one of the cards here, just a plastic card, nothing more, to, to retract this ledge. So you circumvent the whole system. You don't need a card anymore. You just get in, and you're even not even recorded. So probably when you have such a system next time, or when you're approaching it, just look. There is a is a mechanism that you can uh, secure it. There is, for example, when you look at some doors, uh, it's a mechanism that I implemented. You've got a small latch, just just lower than the the latch I've talked about, and uh, when you retract this one. The, the device will lock. So the, the dead bolt will go into the door so you cannot retract the, the latch anymore. So at least there are solutions to that, but most of the time it's, it's just implemented like this. All right. <clears throat> we, of course, talked to the company about this issue and they implemented some countermeasures kind of countermeasures, actually. Um, they mount a display down to the door. I mean, it really makes it a little bit harder to get in. It's not that easy anymore because you don't have these two or three millimeters where you can place your credit card. But it's actually not impossible to get in. You just use a slide the card or something to get in. Of course, there are always implementation issues as well. So probably when you, I don't know, when you build your own house, you have encountered this as well when you say, I want this like this. And if the people don't understand what you really want, they just build it somehow, and, and you can hope that it's all right. Um, they did this at this company as well. So there were some doors where they pulled it just the wrong, wrong way, so it faces to the inside. So you could always get in, but you couldn't get out, actually. Then, 
<laughs> I mean, you could get out, you could use the handle then, so it's pretty senseless. Okay. This one uh, is a picture from Bruce Chenaya. And what he wanted to show was uh, he pointed out some security issues with these keypad entry doors. So you've got this keypad here, and it's a little bit hard to see, actually. I don't know if, if you see that. Could you guess the number of it? Yeah, exactly. It's one, two, three, four. So that's a problem with these keypad entry doors when you don't change numbers from time to time, and you can read this from there. I've got also a little bit more experienced one. <laughs> uh, any guesses so far? Yeah, it is. This one, six, eight, and nine, right? And we could probably also guess the number, the correct number. Could, could be, yeah, I could guess. Um, well, there's, there's a simple solution. I would have also tried 1689, one, one, but it isn't the correct number. The correct would be um, to think about what's the best possible number um, one could enter. And that's most of the time numbers that they can remember very easily. So often it's all just birthday, or birthday year. So depending on how old the system administrator or the manager or however it is, we started 19 probably. Uh, and then it could be 86 or 68. And I, I would say it's, it's probably more realistic to be 68. So it's 1968, the correct number to this keypad. Yeah, and there was, was one last story to this point where, that I wanted to tell you. Uh, I heard this story just a couple of weeks ago, and there was a company who wanted to implement badges, and they, they had badges before, so they thought it would be a good idea to increase security. And what they did, actually, was they introduced visible badges for visitors. And I know if you already noticed it, but this is a security issue, actually. Because when I go there, and I'm, I'm a visitor, I get my visitor's badge. So I get into the company, just walk around a little bit, and accidentally, I lose my badge. So I get upgraded at this moment to an employee, because employees don't wear badges, right? So um, this was a security issue, because of false sense of security then. And, uh, well, yeah, they, they stopped the whole process, so they don't issue any security badges anymore. I don't know if that's better, probably a bit. <laughs> okay, but when you use uh, visible badges, uh, please use them for visitors and employees. And also one important thing is to work together with all your employees. It doesn't really make sense if you just got disposable badges and nobody cares about it. But you really have to work together with all the employees that they understand why these badges are here. And they challenge people that are not wearing these badges or not clearly identifying themselves. And they have to also challenge people like visitors that are in secure areas where they're not supposed to be. It's a really, really important thing here. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> Next point is securing offices, rooms, and facilities. And um, we can do this a couple of different uh, ways. One thing would be to install, of course, good luck, good luck systems. Um, we could. Um, yeah, you could use different lock systems that are in place. Um, well, what I want, want to go to the next slide, I want to tell you also about windows, because we're always talking about doors, but there are windows as well in companies. And uh, the most important thing in these windows is probably that you don't keep them tilted. It's a very, really big security issue. Tilted windows is basically an open window. For, I mean, you just need a couple of seconds to get in. I've also a demonstration video so that nobody can say I'm just telling you and, and not proving anything. But it's, it's probably a little bit dark. Okay, that's a little bit too dark for now, I think. I can show you another video later on, I think it's 
probably the best solution for now. I'll show you the video later on where after the presentation it's a little bit better. Um, okay, let's let's move on at this stage. At this stage. Um, we've got also always this, this sentence in IT security, you always have to take care of the weakest link. And actually it's true. And it's also true for physical security. I've put this picture on it because uh, it shows a really good scenario where they forgot about this probably. It's not really a high security issue here because it's just a fridge and it's in the student dormitories. <laughs> uh, but well, you, what you can see here is uh, there are really not that bad locks at the fridge itself for, for all these uh, small parts in the fridge, but there is a very low, low security, security lock that opens the whole fridge. So it actually is easier to open the whole fridge than just one part of it. And now I can show you a video. It's probably a little bit. And as you can see, it's it doesn't really take much time to, to pick pick these locks. These are very simple locks, these are wafer locks, and you have them in all of these filing cabinets, for example. You also have a lot of them in, in uh, yeah, for, for bike, bicycle security systems and stuff. I did give that back, actually. Uh, the, the need, the, the <laughs> okay. So, please, leak, uh, please always look at the weakest link in your chain. That's, that's the point where the attacker will go to. Now we've got protection against external threats. Um, the standard says you have to protect against uh, threats like fire, like people there throwing Molotov cocktails, probably. <laughs> um, and there is also a solution to this. So um, probably normal window wouldn't keep like this, but there are, you can install also foils on these windows. So it's a good solution if you already implemented, uh, or if you already have windows, you just apply this foil into it. Probably you need an expert because uh, it really has to get tightened. It, it, it has to be installed correctly. Uh, but then this foil isn't that bad. So if also the luck uh, the, the window gets broken, the fall will still be there. It isn't actually really full security, so you can break this, you can get in as well, but it just takes a little longer. So, as we've said before, you're just extending your delay in your system. Now we're approaching working in secure areas. What this means is uh, you <coughs> When you work at, uh, when you're at your work working place, you should never keep uh, important files on your desk when visitors can walk by. You shouldn't place your computer just probably to to a floor where visitors walk by all the time. They can see important information. You should probably install a clean desk policy in your in your environment in your company. This is actually a photo taken in, uh, in Germany by a friend of mine. And he was visiting a company there. And what he experienced was they restructured the building. And the, normally the, the reception would be, the, someone would be there. But actually at this date, nobody was there. And then what they did, they did also place on the right side um, some paper information. And you could issue your own badges there. It was one thing. But it wasn't the whole story. On the left, you've got the list of employees with their telephone numbers on there. So you've got the telephone numbers and the employees as well. And the third point is, you've got the telephone for internal conversations. So, I mean, obviously, probably you could also use it to phone somewhere and to, to, not to, to have your own expenses or something. But you can also use it to, to call employees inside. And I can tell you that, uh, that people, when you call them from an internal phone number, they're, um, they're really more open. So they tell you more stories, they tell you more information. So this is a really, really good point for an attacker to go to.
And there's uh, one issue, I think we're going to the last ones, uh, in secure areas, it's public access. So you've got one point in your company probably where other people are coming in. And you've got also probably, for example, in a company where you've got loading uh, loading base, where you know, someone is approaching with his, with his car and, and want to get things in and out. And uh, you have to, keep, have to take care about these situations, about these areas as well. And probably you have to identify all the people going there, you have to escort them. That would be appropriate measures. What would not be appropriate is just leaving things anywhere and just walking away, leaving all things alone. This is what happened here. It's in a company in Upper Austria. Uh, I think it was Lidl or something. They were selling goods in Upper Austria. And uh, one friend of mine was driving this car there. He was just passing by and he saw that there was nobody at the loading bay, there was nobody at the cars. So he could get in, could get something, and could get away with it. He was really driving on this parking space around. He was making some pictures, but he didn't go in. He just made these pictures for us. But of course, that's not the way to do it. Then we've got the second part of the annex A, and it's equipment security. We won't go into too much detail at every, every part or every step here. I will just uh, want to say at this point, you have to take care of your equipment. And you have to take care of your switches in your company, of your cabling. It shouldn't be easy to get somewhere in, just stick on your laptop or an access point and to get all the information you need. You have to secure every point of this. I've experienced, well actually he was a friend of mine. He was in South Korea for about half a year and he found a switch in one of these buildings he was in. And this is actually really uh, a part where the switch resides in. And he opened it for us to show that it's really open and you can access this switch. You could really easily plug in your own computer or access point. Probably walk later on outside and access the information from outside. You're not at risk anymore. So, I mean, they had actually a video camera there. Just, just besides the switch. But this was pointing into the wrong direction. It was just pointing at the door, but not at the switch. I mean, it means when you enter the company for once, you have get full access to all the information in this company or that are transmitted over the network, actually. Yeah. One last point for here is uh, keep an eye on your equipment. Also, if you're going somewhere else, like... Um, I know, going to some security conferences, uh, going to a customer, you always have to take care of your equipment. For example, if you go uh, to have lunch, there are some policies. In the company where I've worked before, we had these policies. You, you weren't allowed to leave your laptop anywhere alone. So if you have, would have lunch somewhere, you would take your laptop with you at all times. Uh, you would encrypt, of course, your hard drive and everything you've got with you. Um, that's the thing I want to, to say to you, and, and probably you think about that later on as well. I've, I've got also a one, of, a one example here of a security conference in Linz, where I've been last year, I think. And believe me or not, but this notebook, this laptop, belongs to this guy speaking in front. So it was actually the speaker who really forgot his notebook or left his notebook alone somewhere at the back and I was just sitting one row behind him and I was thinking, no, nah, can't it be? He's free, his notebook, right? And I could actually read uh, the, some kind of emails and, and the ones who wrote him emails. I, of course, didn't get to his notebook and change something, but uh, probably it would be interesting how he would react then. And it's not really fair, but take care of, of your equipment. Okay, what, we, what we've covered so far is uh, we've looked at the requirements in the ISO 27001 standard. We've also covered the NIST standard. And uh, now we've talked about all these controls as ISO 27002. And next, I want to mention just the uh, Health Insurance uh, Portability and Accountability Act. It's for hospitals and all that kind of thing that you're using, um, using this health insurance information. We won't go into too much detail at 
this stage. What I want to say at this point is just if you need some controls, if you need some good ideas at next, you can also have a look at this then. And it pretty much covers this, what, about, what we've told so far, what we've talked about so far, but it's also just an additional source to look at. Um, what was also interesting at this standard was they are having some controls that they're suggesting, but the only thing that they really require through standards is secure media disposal and secure media access. So I don't know if it's good or not, but um, I mean, depending on the security of the hospital, as I've heard, it's pretty bad often. So they're using one con computer for one floor, and they've got all the same password for the whole floor, so everybody's just going there and, and typing something. And when you've got no physical security is all there, then uh, you run a high risk, probably. So there's probably really a point where you could improve something. Okay, now we get to more to the last part of our presentation now. And uh, what I want to show you is a practical report from the Financial Services Authority. The report was called Data Security and Financial Services, and they looked at all these physical security things uh, at these companies. And we call basically three areas. One of these areas is access to firms' premises. They basically found out that small firms are implementing keypad entry controls, alarm systems. They also got bad windows and CCTV systems. It doesn't sound that bad, actually. Large firms got additionally got the CCTV systems, strict visitor procedures. They restrict mobile phone usage. And they also have employee awareness trainings. It's really, really actually a good, good way to start. But there were 10 out of 39 firms 10 of 39 companies with basic lapses in physical security. Though they had these controls in place, because probably nobody cared about them. And examples, examples were, they were high burglary risk, but they had no alarm system, no CCTV system in place, no staff. Staff could restricted access to all areas. There was also were some companies to get access to the server room, with a visitor's pass, or they had uh, some kind of security staff employed there, but they didn't really check who was security. So you could probably get in, dress up like a security, get into the server room. Another company had cleaners and receptionists that had full access to offices at all times. It's especially good at night when nobody's in the company, you can <laughs> sleep around a little bit. And of course, this one issue is you got keypad entry systems, but the main door left open. It's a common issue. Also, let if, when you've got, for example, smokers somewhere, and they get in and get out all the time because they're not allowed to smoke inside, so they just keep the door open. And that's also a good, good point where you get in your company sometimes. <clears throat> One uh, example, I don't know if anybody heard about it, it was just really short in the news. Um, there was the airport in Rome. And there was, uh, actually, was, there was a uh, guy from one of the newspapers and he discovered it and he found out that there were no security at all during the night. So they had security but they had just during office hours. A little bit strange. Um, he proved that, that he walked in during the night. He had someone with him to shoot the pictures and he was at the check-in for example. He also accessed some more security areas that should be controlled by card readers or keypads. And he also walked to the security gate. So it's a security check. So, um, well, he could easily probably place uh, some, some, uh, some dangerous goods in there, walk out again, come on the next day, walk in without risk and place it. So that's a really security issue then. <clears throat> yeah, my point. Look at security 24/7, not just during office hours, probably. Then they looked at the clear desk policy. What they found out was that n out of 10 companies had no worrying lack of concern of the clear desk policy. So there were documents with very important information just lying around somewhere. They had the user IDs and password just 
stick under the computers like traditionally, or somewhere similar lying around. So you get just very useful information just by walking by. So you keep a clear desk policy. Then the last bit of this uh, report was storage of paper customer files. And what they found out that that seven, fir seven firms were identified um, that they left the filing cabinets open during the visit. So you, if nobody would have a look at it, you could just grab one of these papers, get it in your, into your pocket and get away, or photograph it, for example. Um, another company left this file cabinet open overnight. This was a security issue because this was also the company where, where the cleaners had full access to the rooms. So you can really get all this important information during night. Cleaners are not getting well paid, so it's probably really interesting for them to get information to sell it otherwise to get a little salary raise for example. okay and uh, now we're concluding all this presentation with some recommendations at the end we've got uh, I, I've had a look at the BIP standard 0074 from the British Standard Institute and I don't write all these recommendations down just put a few of them here it says, uh, for the complete mess and compliance with entry and visitor controls, you have to have entry controls. Either manually or automated. If there's a guard that controls, if there's a machine, it doesn't matter. But somebody has to control the people, who is getting in, who is getting out. You should implement uh, visible badges so you can authenticate yourself. Not just for the visitors, but also for the employees, as we saw before. There's also one point is courting of visitors. Um, it's probably not true for all companies. I've heard of a company, this was in a high security area, and they had this uh, thing. They, they did escort visitors all the time. But the problem was more that um, employees like to work, yeah, probably <laughs> don't like to work always, but they don't want to be disturbed during the work. And uh, well, if there's a visitor sitting there and he says, oh, come on, uh, please, could I get to the bathroom? And he has to stop his work. He has to call him to the, to the bathroom, wait for him, get back, and start working again. So it's a loss of working time, and it's also not very comfortable for him. And if this visitor just asks him, I don't know, three or four times during just half of the day, like, oh, can I get to the bathroom again? He probably would say at some point, oh, come on, you, you already know where the bathroom is. Just get there, and I'll wait for you here. And this happened at this company. It was, it was more in the military sector. And, uh, yeah, the problem was uh, these, these roads didn't apply to old then, and, and visitors could walk, around, could walk around. So it was a security issue then. You should also keep a look at your doors, windows, and rooms. We will look at the window video probably afterwards then. Uh, you have to shut your windows, you have to close the doors, and you have to lock your doors, especially when you're not here. For example, this was the story with the CFO. If we would have locked the door, it would have been probably less problem. You can probably get in any way, but it's harder, and it's more delay. Some recommendations uh, from my side probably would be perform a risk analysis at the beginning, be aware of your own risks, Look what the entry points in your company are and decide whether you want to take the risk or whether you want to mitigate the risk and implement some controls. You can assess your, your company at these different levels we've discussed before. So walk in step by step, have a methodology you work in. And calculate probably entry and response times. This is really a thing we do when, when we go to a company, so we will have a look at, they've got a wall, probably three to four meters high. It probably will take him, I don't know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds to get over this wall, depending on the wall. Then you can calculate the kind of doors you're using and how long it will take to actually get the information. And then you have to calculate how long would it take to detect him and what would be my response to it. How long does the police take to, to get from there to my company, for example? And you compare them. One point that I find it really, really interesting is, uh, or really, really important is, uh, work together with the employees. It's one of the most common things that employees 
just don't attend to the rules. They don't understand the rules, so they don't adhere to it. They just do something other. It's a very, it's get to really uh, social engineering issue then. Uh, so you really have to take care that they're knowing what they're doing and why they're doing. Otherwise, they wouldn't wouldn't like to to follow your rules. And yeah, of course, just ask when you need help. There are a couple of companies outside that are doing this. They're securing the couple of companies that are already implementing these controls, and they will help you as well. Or uh, probably, if, if it's just a small question, you know, if you need some help, you can also email me. And we'll <coughs> help have some emails back and forth. So. And one th last thing I want to. to put in here from the BIP standard was vulnerability testing and physical security checks. Uh, I mentioned that because it's basically the thing that I do and if it wasn't here I wouldn't get money from it. And, uh, but it, it's really important as well. So if you look at your own company, that's good and that's important. So look at your own company, look at the security issues you've got, probably you find some vulnerabilities. But it's also important for an external to get in because he looks at it in different ways. And one last example I got in this presentation is a police station in Low Austria that I found. I, I don't know where, why I walked back to the police station, but I just found it interesting. And what I saw was uh, there's, there was a garage from the police down there. And, uh, well, there weren't any video cameras. The office from the police station was just at the first level and they had no windows to the garage. So you could just walk around and do whatever you want at this backstage. And I had a look at the garage inside, and of course there were police cars. But there was also, you unfortunately can't see it because of my bad, bad skills in photographing. But here would, would have been uh, uh, just one of these buttons where you open and close the doors. You probably you know all, all these, these buttons here, you can open it. And the security issue here was that when you have a look at the garage door, there was really a small, a small hole just to the left of the garage door. So you could dismount this plate, just grab into it, probably with a stick or something, and operate the, the button. So eventually the, the door would open then, you get full access to the police cars. I, of course, didn't do that. I laughed my job too much to, to risk that. But, uh, it is a security issue, and these are the things why you very also hire external people because you probably won't see small things in your company. That's just the reason. Well, what we've done so far, we've uh, looked at the requirements. It was ISO 27001. <coughs> it basically says you do have to do risk assessment and uh, includes all whatever is, is needed to, to secure your information. Then this uh, special publication has these controls where it's the, it said you have to implement physical security. You have, we have had a talk about the controls in the 27002 standard and also short hints to the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. We also did some sort of a free port analysis from the FSA, from the Financial Services Authority, and ended up with some recommendations from the British Standards Institute. So that was pretty much my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And if there are any questions, uh, I'm really happy to answer them. i try to answer them now. So the most common lock types we are using nowadays are pin tumbler locks. These are used in, I don't know, 80% of the systems. This is basically how pin tumbler lock works and how it looks like from the inside. So you've got the housing on the outside and you've got a core on the inside. When you insert the correct key, you can turn the core on the inside. What is preventing the core from turning are actually um, the pins inside. So you've got always a pin stack, there are always two pins, and a spring at the down uh, here, just down here. So the spring pushes these two, two pins into the core. So if you want to if you want to turn the core, you, the, the rotation would have been blocked somehow. Okay. 
as I already said, we've got here driver pins. The driver pins are the lower pins, just near the spring. And we've got key pins. Uh, they're called key pins because these are the ones who, who are, yeah, where the key was, is inserted, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, when you put down the keys, uh, the pins, then you've got one share line. This is the share line just between the core and the housing. And if this line is free, you can move the core. You can rotate the core. So basically what the key does is putting them into the correct height. So you've got the share line free for moving. If you apply the wrong key, then the share line wouldn't be free. So you can't turn. Right? Okay, this is uh, how it looks in a relock. It's just the same. You've got the driver pins, the key pins, and the, the spring stand. That's it. Now, let's move on to picking a pin down the lock. What you are actually using are really small tolerances in the lock when, they, when the locks are built. So, when they do, um, yeah, when they're inserting all these pins, they are drilling these holes for the pins in the housing. And when drilling and milling these holes, they have some variances in it. So sometimes they a little bit more to the left. Probably we can see this in this picture. Then a little bit more to the left, and sometimes a little bit more to the right. The holes they're drilling. Okay. So I'll probably a little bit confused here. When you're picking a lock, um, you try to rotate the core. What happens then? It's the driver pin who gets caught just near the shear line, and it gets stuck. When you apply pressure into this pin stack, you move the, the driver pin down, and the, the, the key pin will be up the shear line, just a little bit above it. So you can turn it. Of course, it's not that easily. You just don't have just one pin stack. You just probably get five, six, seven uh, most common one is five pin stacks. And now, with that information we've got before, that some of these pin sticks are more to the left and more to the right, we've got a new situation. That means if you apply pressure, if you apply rotation to the core, the most, for example, left pin stack will get stuck. So you have to try every pin stack inside, push them a little bit down, and one of these will be a little bit harder. This is the one who gets stuck. And you have to press it so much down that the driver pin is down the shear line, beyond the shear line, and the, the key pin is above the shear line. You can feel that if the core rotates a little bit further then. And then you move on to the second pin stack. It's probably say, the most second, uh, the second one from the left that gets stuck, and so you have to try all, all the very easily to push down. One is a little bit harder, that's the one to go for, and you do that five times and you're finished. That's the theory about that. Okay, you've got a couple of different tools. Um, the most basic ones are the hook. It's just a little hook at the front. You can really easily feel the pin stacks. Easily is a little bit exaggerated. <laughs> you, have, you have to learn to feel it. But um, Then you've got a snake. That's another variant to open a lock. So you just move over all your pin stacks a little bit, push them a little bit down, and with good luck, you've got the correct position. So you apply pressure, and move from the outwards to inwards or otherwise, depending on what you like. And at one point, it will open. The half down one is basically a tool where you can both of these, apply both of these techniques. Okay, and then you've got the, the, the snowball. This is more for the, uh, to the wafer locks, like we've seen before at the fridge, or what you've got the filing cabinets, mostly. And the tension tool is that one you need to rotate the core. So, well, these are a couple, uh, a couple of different tensioners you could use, depending on how many space you've got in the lock. And actually, that was my introduction. Now we get to more interesting part of today, probably, or uh, of lock picking. I'll just probably show you one or two locks, how I use my hands to open it, and then you're invited to come over and, and just try it out yourselves. <coughs> okay. So, 
I know what's, what's best. Can, can I say? Probably move just a little bit over there. Sorry. <laughs> Not that easy. <laughs> okay. Say you've got the core, and that one has to move. And most of these locks are it's into it's clockwise to turn clockwise. So you apply a little bit of pressure here. Please don't apply too much pressure. It's uh, it's the most common mistake at the beginning to apply too much pressure. It's very very little pressure you need. And then, in my case, I've got a hook, and I try out the different pin sizes. I'll push them down, and eventually it will open. We've got other, <coughs> other locks here as well. Probably that one is a very cheap one, for example, but it's the same kind of lock you probably use in, in some kind of doors. And here it's basically the same. You just insert your, your tensioner. You can also insert it at the, the lower end. Or you insert your tensioner, apply pressure just a little bit, now I'm using the snake. And what I'm doing is just get into the lock, pushing the pins a little bit down, apply, still, still apply pressure, and move it to the front. And you do that probably a couple of times, and then it opens. OK? So basically, that's it from our part. And uh, yeah, please uh, just try it out yourselves and, and have fun with it.